So we've introduced Stop and Wait, the, the, the flow control protocol. Uh, the basic mechani mechanism is that the source sends a data frame. The destination, when it receives that data frame, because it puts the data inside a buffer, and we have limited bu buffer space, if there's enough if there's enough buffer space to receive the next data frame or another data frame, then the destination responds with an acknowledgement, an act frame. The source cannot send more data until it receives an act for the previous data frame. So we have one data frame at a time. Data act, data act, data act, and we continue on. This example shows one specific instance where at the top we have computer B receives the first data frame and then has no space in the buffer for a second data frame. Let's see. So there's a, there's a short time where the buffer is full at the receiver and therefore the act does not come back. So we wait for space to become available in the buffer before we send the act. Even though we've received the data, we don't acknowledge that data until we have space for another data frame. So that's the flow control working at, com at the destination B. Of course, if we have space, then we can immediately send the act, like is illustrated here with the second data frame. And of course, the timing, this is just one instance showing the timing, of course, the timing the sending of the act may be delayed much more than what's illustrated here. And we may keep going. This diagram does not illustrate the completion. There should be data, uh, the propagation, the act, and so on. So we looked at an example that showed the performance of this. The example we went through, and we'll calculate a, a few variations of it to see what happens when we change the different network parameters. So we'll just make note of what we come up with yesterday. Yesterday we had an example, or we followed this example, and we saw it was, if we zoom in, or zoom out, in fact, it was something like this. That is, we sent the data frame, we received the data frame, small processing delay, send the act, and receive the data. This took 8,341 microseconds. The amount of data in each data frame was 1,000 bytes. which gave us a throughput. Every data frame contains 1,000 bytes of real data. It takes 8,341 microseconds, which was the sum of these components. This took 8160. Propagation out in our example was, what was it, 10 microseconds? There was one processing delay. I haven't shown that very clearly in this diagram. We had it yesterday. 160 to transmit the act back, plus 10. 8160 plus 10 plus 1 plus 160 plus 10 is 8341. It's just the sum of those components. So by drawing the diagram, you can visualize what's happening and especially the delay. You just follow through and you get the total time from here to here. And the next data frame was the same another 8,341 microseconds, and the next one the same. If we, had, if we had an infinite number of frames, if we kept going, that would be the same. So the throughput, on average, we're delivering 1,000 bytes every 8,341 microseconds, gave us 
959 kilobits per second or an efficiency of 95.9%. So that was the ca case yesterday. What if we change the data size to 10,000 bytes? Quickly find the answer of what is the throughput and efficiency. Change the data size to 10,000 bytes, everything else the same. Someone tell me the answer. No. <laughs> the data size has been increased from 1,000 bytes to 10,000 bytes. The data frame contains the data plus a header. We had 160 bits of header. If we drew the diagram, we'll just draw the first part. Okay, we have the transmission of the data frame. 10,000 bytes plus the header of 20 bytes, the same as we had yesterday. Times by eight, convert the bits, divided by one megabit per second gives us 80,160 microseconds to transmit the data frame. Because the data frame is 10,000 bytes plus 20 bytes of header. So the transmission time will be, if we times all that by eight, 80,160 microseconds. Propagation is the same. Processing is another one. The ACK is the same, 160. And propagation back another 10. Add them up. And it takes a total of 80,341 microseconds. Same approach, we just have a different transmission time in this case. And we'd calculate the throughput as our data size divided by the total time. <coughs> and with the calculator, it turns out to be approximately 996 kilobits per second. It's not the same. We've increased our throughput from 959 up to 996. Or 99.6 percent efficient. That is of our one megabit per second data rate, the link, 99.6 percent of the time we're sending real data across that link. The other 0.4 percent of the time we're transmitting some header, we're waiting for the act. That is 96% of the time sending real data, 0.4% of the time sending header and waiting. Because we increase the data size, we increase the throughput and efficiency. Okay. Uh, no. Uh, in this example, in this example, there's enough space in the buffer to receive the next frame. That is, computer B receives the data frame. Let's say the buffer space at computer B is one megabyte. So it receives a data frame, in this case just 1,000 bytes. It's got a lot of space available, so it immediately sends the ACK. It's prepared to receive the next frame. Same here, with a buffer of one megabyte, even if we receive 10,000 bytes, we can receive another 10,000 bytes. So in this example, the buffer space is greater than what we need. And hence the immediate act comes back. There was one, one microsecond of processing time. 
That is, we still need to process what we receive, but then we can immediately send the act back. We'll see a case when that's not true in a moment. So this case is the best case where we have enough buffer space available. So in fact, we don't, we don't have the flow control or the, we don't have the receiver slowing down the sender. If the data received, no, if the buffer space is not enough to fit another data frame, then we'd need to not return an act. We'll show that just in a moment. Let's finish this example. All we've done in this example is increase the data size from 1,000 up to 10,000. And increasing the data size increased our throughput and efficiency. Because we spend more time sending real data as opposed to sending header and waiting. Opposite direction, if you decrease the data size relative to everything else, the throughput will go down. Before we look at what happens with a different size buffer, one more case. Revert back to the original case as on the slide. What if the propagation delay is 100 microseconds? In the example, it was 10 microseconds. What's going to happen with our efficiency? Go up or down, or the same? Propagation delay is increased from 10 microseconds to 100 microseconds. Why? Because we'll spend more time waiting. Although my diagrams are not to scale, if we compare this one to this one, we transmit and then we have to wait. The time we wait depends upon the propagation delay of 10 microseconds. If we need a large, if we have a larger propagation delay, that is it takes longer for that frame to arrive, then it's going to be a larger time waiting. So this would still be our 8160. 100 instead of 10, 1, 160, 100. The total time is much longer to deliver the one frame, therefore our efficiency and throughput will go down. So the main factors that impact upon stop and wait performance are the size of the data and the propagation delay. The header size impacts, but normally the header size is very small compared to the data. So in our example, the header was just 20 bytes, which is very small compared to the 1,000 bytes of, of data. So even changing the header from 20 bytes to 10 bytes, it will change the efficiency, but not by much. So the main factors that impact are the data size and the propagation delay. Header size, act size, processing delay are normally quite small. And that's, like you see on the next slide, a general equation that states the efficiency of stop and wait is given here, where the equation, we have the efficiency and we have data. In this case, data represents the time to transmit the data, the real data. So that means the time to transmit the 10,000 bytes, for example. So it's the data, the time to transmit that data, divided by the total time. That is, the time to transmit the real data divided by the total time. And the total time includes the real data, the header, if I can control this thing, the header, and that's the time to transmit the header of the data frame. So if the header was 20 bytes, 160 bits, and we had a data rate of one megabit per second, the time to transmit the header is 160 microseconds. That's the time to transmit the header here. Time to transmit the act. In this equation, we don't include processing delay. Of course, 
we could make it more accurate, include processing delay, but in most cases, processing delay is very small compared to the other components. So in this general equation, we've omitted that. And importantly, two times the propagation delay. We need to propagate the data frame to the destination and receive the act back. So assuming header and ACK are small, the main factors are the data size and the propagation delay. And the larger the propagation delay, the less efficient we are. And the smaller the data size, the less efficient. In general, if we have a very high data rate, if we have a very high data rate, the data transmission time will be small. High data rate, small transmission time. Therefore, in a stop and wait becomes inefficient. Examples include optical fiber links. With the optical fiber link, we can send a gigabits per second. In our example, we had one megabit per second. If we had one gigabit per second, the transmission time would go, would be reduced by 1,000 from 8,341 down to 8 microseconds. And therefore the transmission time, or in our equation, the data would be much smaller and the efficiency would be much smaller. In links which have long propagation delays, and a propagation delay depends mainly on the distance. So links which have a large distance will lead to low efficiency because propagation delay goes up, efficiency goes down. Satellite links, for example, when you have a geostationary satellite 36,000 kilometers away, propagation delay is quite large compared to the other factors. Stop and wait will become inefficient. By inefficient, in some cases, you get down to 10, 20% efficiency as opposed to 90, 95%. And if you have small data frames, if instead of 1,000 bytes we sent just 10 bytes, you'd do the calculations and you'd see the throughput and efficiency would go down. So in those cases, stop and wait is inefficient. And therefore, we'd need some way to improve upon that, an alternative protocol. And that is the sliding window flow control protocol. But coming back to one, one more point, one more example, what happens if the buffer size is limited? Let's say we have, back to our original example where we're sending data frames with a thousand bytes of data, and the buffer at the receiver can store 1,500 bytes. So we have enough memory to store 1,500 bytes at a time. At the start, we transmit the first data frame. It contains 1,000 bytes of data. It propagates, it's received. If we illustrate the buffer that can contain 1,500 bytes, we put that data inside the buffer at the receiver. We have 500 bytes of space remaining in this case, assuming all of our data frames are 1,000 bytes, all the same size, what does the receiver do? What does the receiver do at this point? The buffer is for the receiver. We care about controlling the rate of the sender such that we don't overflow the buffer at the receiver. What is the receiver going to do now? B. No. 
the only other option is not do that. So it's received 1,000 bytes it no under the assumption that all frames are going to contain 1,000 bytes of data. We've got 500 bytes of space available in the buffer. We cannot fit another frame in the buffer. Therefore, we should not allow the source to send another frame. Do not send an axe. So even though we receive the data, do not send an axe back. Because in terms of the number of frames, this buffer can really just fit one frame at a time. Even though it's 1,500 bytes, every, every frame is going to be 1,000 bytes in this example. Therefore, because it's got one frame inside the buffer, we cannot allow the source to send another frame. Uh, not look ahead, it just received the data. So as soon as you receive the data, you put it inside memory, check how much space is available. Is it enough for another frame? No, do not send an axe. If, if it was 2,000, then it could send an axe. In this case, it's not enough. So this is flow control working. What, what happens next? Yeah, we need to consume the data in the buffer. Who consumes it? The higher layer. Remember, this is at the data link layer. The receiver has received the data, and eventually it needs to pass it to the user at computer B. And from the data link layer's perspective, it passes it to the network layer and lets the network layer deal with that. As soon as it has passed that data to the network layer, it can delete it from the buffer. So if some time later, this arrow represents the network layer, layer say, reads the buffer, reads from the buffer, that is, the network layer takes from the buffer 1,000 bytes, then if I draw the buffer, it is now empty. And because it's empty, we are prepared to receive one more frame. So now send the axe. And now A can send the next frame. Uh, at the implementation of the data link layer in the receiver. So, yeah, it could be in a LAN card, uh, in a modem, if we're talking about a, modem, a separate modem. Uh, the buffer could be part of the memory. What is it in that hardware? Yeah, the buffer is memory, RAM. The queuing delay is the time spent time data spends waiting in memory in a buffer. So yes, from the spec perspective of the higher layer, the, this packet that's arrived may incur some queuing delay. The time it waits in here is some delay for that packet and we count that as queuing delay. Yes, we've got an yeah. In this simple example, we'll assume all frames contain a thousand bytes of data. Yes, so when we receive the frame, a computer is, so a, a processor is actually checking that frame when it receives it. It may check if there's no errors in there, which we haven't spoke about, but it may be doing error detection on that frame. That takes time. So as an example, the previous one said that that was one microsecond. That is, receive, process for one microsecond, 
if we've got buffer space, then send it out. If not, wait until we've got buffer space. Yep. So this is how the receiver slows down the sender. Because the sender cannot send at this point in time, it has to wait. And therefore we do not overflow the receiver. Yeah, yeah the, the size of the the size of the frame is important, yeah. and knowing it is important. We haven't said much about how that's done just yet, and we will not not yet. At this stage, we assume magically that they both know the size of the frame. We'll talk about the the most appropriate sizes at some point, but not yet. So, the problem with stop and wait is that with a long link, that is a large propagation delay, or a very fast link, that is a small transmission time, it can be inefficient because we spend a lot of time waiting compared to transmitting real data. So the solution is to allow the source to send more frames at once before we have to wait for an act. And that's what we'll go through for sliding window. This talk about what size frames to use, we will come back to it at some later point. We will not discuss it right now. I want to first try to introduce the concepts of sliding window. So Stop and wait allows one frame to be in transit at a time. That is, we can transmit one. We can think from the sender's perspective. It's transmitted somewhere that, net, that frame is on the link or it's being acknowledged. We cannot send another before we receive that acknowledgement. In sliding window, the concept is to allow multiple frames to be in transit at a time. Allow the source to send W frames, a window size of frame, before it has to wait for an act. That's the concept. For this to work, and we'll explain how it do does work, but for it to work, because we're allowed to send multiple frames, frame one, frame two, frame three, we're going to need sequence numbers for these frames. I just said frame one, two, and three, we need to keep track that it is frame one, frame two, and frame three. Yeah. So each frame that we send needs to include a sequence number. And that's included in the header. So we've given examples where we said in the previous case that there was a 20 byte header. What did that include, that 20 bytes? We didn't say what it included. It may have included an address of the source and destination. And another thing it may include is a, head, is a sequence number. So in a data frame, we have the real data and a header. header. One part of the header includes the sequence number. The other parts we don't care about right now. But importantly for sliding window, we do need a sequence number. So a certain number of bits of the header are allocated for this sequence number. If we have a k-bit sequence number, then the values it can take is from 0 to k minus 1. If, for example, we have a 3-bit sequence number, then we can have values the value is zero in decimal up to seven. Because we only have a fixed number of bits allocated in the header for a sequence number, then we've got a limited number of sequence numbers to give to frames. But in general, I may want to send a large number of frames. I want to send a thousand frames. I need to give every frame a sequence number. Then I start from zero go up to the maximum value and then wrap around. So if 
I wanted to send many frames, then the first frame would be frame number zero. I would give it the sequence number zero. In the header, the sequence value, sequence number value will be zero. The next frame will be one, two. The eighth frame will be sequence number seven. The ninth frame will be zero. We wrap around and we can go forever just wrapping around. So the first frame I send, the eighth frame, the ninth frame, the tenth frame, and so on. That's how we use the sequence numbers. How long is a sequence number? It depends upon the specific protocol. In general, we say it's k bits in length. As an example, it could be three bits. Different protocols would define the number of bits that they use. We use these sequence numbers. The sender and receiver use them to keep track of the frames that they have sent. Because we're going to allow the sender to send not just one frame and wait for an act, but send one, two, three, four W frames, and then an act come back, then both the sender and receiver are going to keep track of the frames that have been sent and other things like the frames that they're allowed to send. So we'll explain that in the next slide. So we need sequence numbers in each frame that is sent. Any questions on sequence numbers so far? Just a, a k bit value in the header? Okay, let's explain how they are used. First, looking at the sender, what does the sender do? Remember, the goal is to allow the sender to send multiple frames at once before it has to wait for an acknowledgement. We say the sender is allowed to send up to W frames in general, a window size of frame, W meaning the window. We'll see why it's a window with the, our example. So we can send up to W frames before we have to wait for an act. In stop and wait, in fact, stop and wait is a special case of sliding window because in stop and wait, we can send one frame, wait for an act. Sliding window, send W frames, wait for an act. If W equals one, stop and wait is in fact sliding window. So now we're allowed to send multiple frames. For this to work, the sender needs to keep track of what it, what it has done in terms of the frames that it is sent and also the frames that have been acknowledged. So we can think that the, the sender has three variables that it records. So at one point in time, these three variables have some values to indicate the frames that have been transmitted and also we've received an acknowledgement for. So of a large sequence of frames, many frames we want to send, at some point in time, we will know what is the last frame acknowledged. So if we look at some sequence of frames given here, they can go back here from zero through to seven, and there can be more as well. And of course we send frames in order. We always send frame with sequence number zero, and then with sequence number one, two, and so on. And the receiver always acknowledges in order then at some point in time, if we have sent some frames and we've received an acknowledgement for those frames, then from the sender's perspective, we could say that the last frame acknowledged is frame with sequence number five. That's in this example. So that's one variable, the last frame that has been acknowledged or more precise, the last frame that, that has been transmitted and we've received an acknowledgement for. Of course, if five has been acknowledged, that implies so has four. Because we do things in order, if we received an act for five, it means we've also received an act for four, and three, and all the ones beforehand. The second thing we keep track of is the last frame that has been transmitted, but not yet acknowledged. So we're allowed to transmit frames before we have to wait for an act. So at some point in time, we may have transmitted some frames, 
and we're still waiting for an act. That would be the, so the last frame transmitted and not yet acknowledged in this example is frame with sequence number seven. So in this example, we have transmitted frames up until here. We've received acts for all of these frames. We're still waiting for the acts for frame six and frame seven. That's what this diagram illustrates. We're allowed to send a maximum of W frames before we have to wait for an act. So in this example, let's say W max in the example only is seven. The maximum number of frames we're allowed to send before waiting for an acknowledgement in this example is seven. We have sent two frames, frame number six, frame number seven. If we're allowed to send seven before waiting for an act, it means we're allowed to send another five. And that's what this blue box shows. There are two frames transmitted, but not yet act. We're allowed to send, have a maximum of seven outstanding, so we could transmit at this point in time another five. So we keep track of how many frames we're allowed to transmit at this point in time or the current window size. In this example, the current window size is five. The last frame act is frame with sequence number five. The last frame transmitted is frame with sequence number seven. The current window size is five frames. The number of frames transmitted and not yet act plus the current window size is always equal to the maximum value in this example seven. If we receive an act for frame six, then these values would change. Because if we receive an act for frame six, then frame six is now the last frame acknowledged. And it's illustrated in this diagram by this solid bar. You'd think that moves along to here. Frame six has been acknowledged. Seven is still outstanding, <coughs> has not yet been acknowledged. And the blue box would cover zero, one, two, three, four, and five. Because if one frame has been acknowledged, frame seven is outstanding. We're allowed to have a maximum of seven outstanding, so we would be allowed to transmit another six, which would be, if we go in order, frame zero, one, two, three, four, five. This, these three parameters are used to control how much we send and keep track of what's been acknowledged. Of course, we may not have data to send, even though I'm allowed to send five more frames at this case, if I don't have the data to send, I will not send frames. So it just gives us the maximum amount of frames we can send. We'll see this example a little bit more. In the receiver is almost the same, except it keeps track of what's been received and what it has sent acknowledgement for. So the receiver has buffer space for f up to W frames. For f so in our example, seven frames. There's enough buffer in the receiver to store seven frames, not eight frames. If we received an eighth frame, we would overflow the receiver. So what the receiver does is record three values as well, similar to what the transmitter has. The last frame that has been acknowledged, so the receiver receives data frames, sends back acts. At some point in time, it has received these frames and also sent the acknowledgement for these frames. So the last frame act is frame five in this case. It may have received frames, but not yet sent an act for them. It may be processing those frames. So in this example, the receiver has received frames six and seven they're stored in the buffer, it's processing them, they're about to be delivered to the network layer but have not yet been acknowledged. So the last frame received and not yet act in this example is frame seven. And 
because the receiver can store up to W frames, then in this example, seven frames, we've received two and we have them in the buffer, we're allowed to receive another five. And that's what the blue box, the blue rectangle indicates. We've got two in the buffer, we can fit seven in the buffer, we could receive another five and still be okay. We could not receive another six because that would overflow the buffer. No, there, there could be processing time. For example, imagine six and seven are in the buffer now. We've received these two frames, we put them in the buffer, we're processing them. We're processing maybe frame six, what frame seven is waiting to be processed. So this would be the current state of the receiver. At that point in time, there are three variables that the receiver keeps track of. It has re received and acknowledged frame five. It has received, but has not yet acknowledged up to frame seven. By keeping track of the variable seven, it implies that we've also received and not yet axed six. Because if we've axed five, we have not acknowledged seven, then that implies we have not acknowledged six as well. So we've received these two, they're in the buffer being processed or waiting to be processed. We could potentially receive another five frames. If we, rec we cannot receive more than five because that would overflow our buffer. No, this, this, from here to here, you see there are seven frames, two in the buffer, five allowed to be received, they haven't yet been received, the total is seven. And in this example, that's the maximum size of the buffer. No, in this case, the, the buffer is seven, seven frames. Uh, we cannot because the, if we go back, the sender is also keeping track of these values and the sender knows it has sent two frames. It's allowed to send frames zero through to four. That is, it's allowed to send another five. It cannot send another six because it's following the protocol which says that if you've sent two, you're not allowed to send another, f or you're not allowed to send more than five before you have to wait for an ax. If we receive an ax, we can send another frame. Because if we receive an ax for frame six, then this line moves along. Frame six moves into the set that have been acknowledged. We only have one frame outstanding, frame seven. So if we received an act for frame six, you imagine this line is here now, frame seven is outstanding, we'd be allowed to send another six frames, give us a total of seven. Uh, we're only focusing on the buffer at the receiver. The, this is just introducing the, the, really the three parameters that the both the sender and receiver keep track of in order to control how much you can send. In stop and wait, it was simple. We could send just one frame, then wait for an ax. In sliding window, we can send up to W frames, and then we have to wait for an ax. But we may not send all W at the same time. We may send three frames, and then we're allowed to send another four because the maximum we can send is seven. Let's combine these two together. So this is what the sender keeps track of, these three va variables, last frame act, last frame transmitted but not yet act, the number of frames allowed to be sent. So three variables, the current window size, that you think of this blue rectangle as the window. And the receiver does similar, it keeps track of three variables last frame acknowledged, last frame 
received but not yet acknowledged. The current set of frames that we expect to receive in the future or are allowed to receive. Let's go through an example that tries to illustrate those two together. So I know in your handouts it's not very easy and the colours don't come out, so follow this one and then you'll understand it and it won't worry about the handouts. Yep. <coughs> no, it's for allowing the source to send multiple frames before it waits for an app. We'll draw a diagram to increase efficiency. In this case, sent one frame, wait for an act. We want to allow this. Send multiple frames before we have to wait for an act. If we can do this, we spend more time transmitting data out of the total time. That's a goal. Let's go through this example. So we have a source, the sender, it has some data to send and sending to destination B. What this diagram is showing is the, those three variables, graphically showing the values of those three variables from the source's perspective and from the destination's perspective. And the solid bar or the long bar here is the frames that have been transmitted and acknowledged, so anything to the left of this, we've completed. If we've sent the frame and we received an act, you can think that that frame was successful, forget about it from the transmitter's perspective. We've finished that. So initially, the source has not sent anything. Okay? So the first frame we're going to send is frame number zero. And from the source's perspective, if we have not sent anything, we're allowed to send a maximum of seven frames. We're allowed to send. We don't have to, but we're allowed to send a maximum of seven frames. In this example, the maximum we're allowed to send at one time is seven. And that's what this blue rectangle indicates, that we're allowed to send frames zero through to six. And since we're allowed to send seven frames, in this example, we only have three frames to send. Let's say every frame was a thousand bytes. We only have 3,000 bytes of data to send. Therefore, we send three frames. Frame zero, frame one, frame two. And those frames contain the sequence numbers, zero, one, and two. That is, zero, one, and two are transmitted. They take time to transmit. There's some transmission time, transmission time. After the transmission of those three, from the perspective of the source, it has transmitted frames 0, 1 and 2 and it's allowed to send another four frames because the maximum it's allowed to have outstanding is seven, always. Outstanding frames are those that have been transmitted but not yet act or those that are allowed to be transmitted. So 0, 1 and 2 are frames that have been transmitted but not yet acknowledged. If it had the data, it could send frames 3, 4, 5 and 6. But in this example, there's no data to send at this point in time. Sometime later, after the propagation delay, the frames start to arrive at the destination. Initially at the destination, we had received no frames. So this is the initial view of the destination. No frames received, none in the buffer. Then we receive a frame, frame 0. And then a short time after, we receive frame one and frame two. After receiving those three, from the perspective of the destination B, we've received frames zero, one and two. They are stored in the buffer. And because we have a buffer size for seven frames, we've got three in the buffer, we can receive another four, which would be three, four, five and six. So at that point in time, after receiving three frames, 
the destination has those three in the buffer. And in the future, it may expect to receive another four because the buffer can handle a maximum of seven. The, the receiver can send a, uh, an acknowledgement. What do we call the acknowledgement? In this case, it's RR. Receiver ready, which is essentially an acknowledgement from our perspective. It's saying, well, the name given in this, this diagram from the textbook is to say that the receiver is ready to receive more data, this RR frame. Or it's an acknowledgement saying, I've received some data, I'm ready to receive more. So that's this RR frame here. Now here's something different from what we've seen before. Think of it as an acknowledgement. Yeah. It's a small frame to indicate to the sender, I'm ready to receive more frames. Yes. We'll see the exact meaning. Same as in stop and wait. If we sent data, and if we send this frame back, this ACK frame, it indicates to the sender the receiver is ready to receive more. It's just a different name used in this diagram. Receive ready, ACK, same meaning from our perspective. But what's different, or what is different from what we've covered in the past is that in this specific case, we receive three frames. We send one acknowledgement back to acknowledge all three frames. We don't have to, but in this example, we send just one act. The way that it works is that the number in the receive ready or the act frame indicates the next sequence number we expect to receive. B has received 0, 1, and 2. Therefore, the next one it expects to receive, I'm ready to receive 3. Effectively, that acknowledges frames 0, 1, and 2. So, before we sent this receive ready, we had 3 frames in the buffer. They have been received but not acknowledged. They are removed from the buffer, those three frames. They've been processed. So we send back an acknowledgement saying we're ready to receive frame number three. So in our perspective of B here, zero, one and two move into the set that have been received and acknowledged. They've been processed and we've finished with those frames. Because those three frames have now been acknowledged and removed from the buffer, the receiver can receive another three frames. So our window moves along. Before we could receive another four frames, three, four, five, and six, we just removed three frames from the buffer and acknowledged those three. So we're prepared to receive another three frames, zero, one, seven, zero, and one. So the blue rectangle indicates the set of frames we ex expect to receive in the future. Okay, let's get past that step. Any questions? <laughs> What's confusing? <laughs> so, although we don't show the details, in this case, at this point in time, we receive three frames, put them in the buffer, and then the network layer removes them from, from the buffer. So here, we consume those frames, remove them from the buffer. As a result, we send a receive ready message. We've finished those three. Yeah, receive ready expecting frame number three. From the sender. Yes, from the sender. All right, we'll come to that in a moment. Okay, okay. Any other questions? So think of the acknowledgement that says that 
I've received those frames you sent me. The next one I expect is frame number three. It implicitly acknowledges the previous frames. Because we receive them and acknowledge in order, if we say we expect to receive frame three, that means when system A receives this receive ready, A knows, okay, I have previously sent zero, one, and two. I receive a message saying the receiver is ready to receive frame three. That must mean zero, one, and two have been acknowledged. And therefore, zero, one, and two move into the set which are transmitted and acknowledged and allows the transmitter to send another three frames. This receive ready has effectively acknowledged three frames. That's not what the three means here. The three means I expect to receive frame number three. But from the source's perspective, that means if they're ready to receive frame three, that means they must have received and processed zero, one, and two, the previous ones. And therefore, it acknowledges those three frames, and for every frame we acknowledge, we're allowed to send another one. So before, before we receive the receive ready, source A was allowed to send four more frames, three, four, five, and six, after it receives the receive ready, it's allowed, to rece it's allowed to send another three. Three, four, five, and six, plus seven, zero, and one. So the window is now seven. Well, but there's still any. The window right. of allowed to send is seven. Right. Yep. So the withdrawal is still in sequence. Yes, but you see, so the goal is that you'll see that they're following the same pattern here, but of course they're not exactly at the same time. If we look, time is increasing as we go down. At this point in time, they're the same, but at this point in time, they're, th they're different. But as we receive and send acts, because there's some <coughs> propagation delay, eventually they'll maintain, they'll be synchronized from their perspective. That's the goal. So, we've sent three frames. We've received an act saying the receiver is ready to receive frame number three. Acknowledging frames number zero, one, and two. A, yeah? the number of frames are Yes, it depends on how much data you have. This limits, or this sets a maximum amount of data we're allowed to send. At maximum at the start, we could send seven frames. But we only sent three in this example. Why? Maybe computer A didn't have more than three frames of data to send. It only, if every frame was a thousand bytes, it only had three thousand bytes to send. It's allowed to send seven frames, but depending on, on the circumstances, it may not have the data to send. So. It sent three, they were acknowledged, and now it's allowed to send another seven frames. Three through to one. In this example, it sends four frames. Why? Just in this example, let's say now the user has delivered four more frames of data to the source. That is, maybe at the start, some user clicked a button, send 3,000 bytes. We send those 3,000 bytes with three frames. Sometime later, here, the user clicks a button, send 4,000 bytes. So we're allowed to send seven frames. We have 4,000 bytes or four frames worth of data. So we transmit four frames. Frame number three, four, five, and six. These are the sequence numbers. From the source's perspective, we were allowed to send seven. We transmit four, therefore we're allowed to send another three. Because there's always a maximum of seven allowed to be outstanding. The four that we've transmitted, plus another three. And that's shown here. Three, four, five, and six have been transmitted. 
We haven't yet received an act. We're allowed to send 701s. We haven't sent them yet. Maybe we don't have the data to send. We cannot send anything beyond that because we are limited to sending or having seven frames outstanding at any one time. So from the source's perspective, we transmitted four. In the meantime, at the receiver, we received the first frame, frame three. Remember there's some propagation delay? You transmit, it receives a bit later. In this case, the receiver decides, I've received this frame, I'm going to immediately send an acknowledgement. It processes the data in frame three, it was put into the buffer, immediately taken out of the buffer, send an acknowledgement. And that's this RR4. After receiving frame three and processing frame three, the receiver is ready to receive frame four and hence sends back an RR4. No, this. No, this. No, no, not reset. We, in, we're transferring data <coughs> over, say, a long period of time, say, over a connection. We set up a connection. We've turned on the two computers. They're transferring data for all time. We just continue using this same set of sequence numbers, wrapping around where needed. So, so these... This diagram show a, a sequence of possible frames. Anything to the, so at this point in time from the receiver's perspective, we have received two, one, zero, and anything to the left of that. Maybe before this, we'd received other frames, but we just don't show it here. So zero, one, and two are frames that have been received and acknowledged. The vertical line here indicates the next frame, or to the left of that, are the frames that have been received and acknowledged. The blue rectangle indicates the frames we're allowed to receive. Because we've received 0, 1, and 2, we'd expect to receive frame 3 next. And in fact, we sent a receive ready for frame 3 here. The sender sends zero one two three four five six seven zero one two three four five six. Yeah, the timing. So these diagrams, that this example just shows, after receiving frame three and transmitting this receive ready. If you, you see that the the picture or this graphic shows or happens after this event. Received a frame, transmitted a receive ready in response. And this is the view from the receiver's perspective of the, those three variables. So you can align, how long have we got? You can align at the start before we do anything. This is the current view of the source. This is the current view of the destination. After receiving three frames, this is the view of the destination. After transmitting the receive ready, after receiving frame three and transmitting RR4, this is the view of the receiver. In, in this example, the receiver decided to do something different from up before. At the start, the receiver received three frames and then sent a receive ready. To illustrate something different in this example, we receive one frame and then send a receive ready. Uh, sliding window is used in, in TCP. 
And TCP is used in almost all downloads over the internet. That is reliable data transfer. So the same concepts are used in downloading data across the internet. It's more complex in TCP. This is the easy part. So let's try and finish this case. So just in this example, we receive frame three, immediately send an act. So from the receiver's perspective, we've now received zero, one, two, and three, and we've acknowledged them. We expect to receive another seven. We've got buffer space for another seven. That's from the receiver's point of view at this point in time. Slightly after that, the receiver will receive frames four, five, and six. It does not send an act. So from the receiver's point of view, it's received an act zero, one, two, and three. It is received, but not yet act, four, five, and six. So it's got four, five, and six in the buffer, three frames in the buffer. It can accept another four frames in the buffer, which are seven, zero, one, and two. Again. Yes, possibly. That is, it's not shown here because we haven't finished. This could go forever as we stop at some point. Yep. So we get to a point from the transmitter, it has sent three, four, five, and six. They are outstanding. It's allowed to send seven on zero and one, but it doesn't have the data to send, but it's still allowed to. And then it receives the receive ready, saying the receiver is ready to receive frame four, which acknowledges frame three. If they're ready to receive frame four, it must mean the previous frames that we've sent, less than four, have been received and acknowledged. So. Three four, and three, four, five, and six were outstanding. We received, received ready for four. So now three has been acknowledged. Four, five, and six are outstanding. And we're allowed to send another four frames. The, the time to get from when you transmit until when it's received is the propagation delay. So maybe it, maybe it, it, maybe it increased. That half step, but we continue to send. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So you don't know that it's propagating across the link until you've fully received it. And this is just illustrating, in fact, the propagation delay may vary. So the action that we try that uh, how many uh, receive or uh, send already is after the Yes. So after transmitting four frames, three, four, and five, three, four, five, and six are outstanding. We receive RR4. After RR4, we know that the fourth frame received, so we receive RR4. No. Yes, yes. They know that the third frame is received. Three, four, five, and six have been transmitted, and we receive receive ready for four, then anything less than four must be acknowledged. Therefore, this vertical bar moves one place to the right. Three becomes a frame that has been transmitted and acknowledged. Four, five, and six still haven't been acknowledged yet. Maybe if we keep going, we'd receive an acknowledgement later. More complex than stop and wait, but can be more efficient. Okay, answer this problem. If we continue on, and the next thing that happens
What happens? What's the viewpoint from the receiver and transmitter? Try and calculate. Either draw this. Okay, let's see if everyone else can calculate that. You don't have to draw the diagram, you can just keep track. What are the variables? That is, from the sender's perspective, last frame act, last frame transmitted, but not yet act and the current window size. They were listed on the previous slide. Similar, the receiver has three variables. What are their values after we receive this? Receive ready. Try and calculate for them. If you can, then you're on track to knowing what's happening. So, if we follow this diagram now, the receiver sends RR6. So here, there's an RR6. Try and calculate on your own. RR6. So from the source, there'll be three variables. They'll have values. And also at the receiver, there'll be three variables. There'll be last frame act, last frame, they're listed on your slides, in the previous slides, receive and not yet act, and the current window size. I want to know the values of those three variables at the source and at the destination. What's the value of the first variable, last frame act? We've got two different answers. Anyone else want to try? What about the last frame act from the transmitters, so the source's perspective? Yes. So many, some people have said five, some have six. Receive ready six. What does that mean? Ready to receive sequence number six. We previously had transmitted four, five, and six. If the destination says it's ready to receive six, that must mean four and five have been successfully received. So we've the source knows it sent four, five, and six. If it receives the message saying the destination is ready to receive six, that implies four and five have been completed. So the last frame act is five. Four and five have been act, the, the largest one is five there. So this vertical line would move two places to the right. Last frame transmitted, but not yet act. It's still six. We haven't sent any more. We'd previously sent four, five, and six. Four and five are act. Six still is outstanding. It's been transmitted, but not yet act. So in fact, if five has been act, six has not, we in fact have one frame outstanding. What's the current window size? Not current window slide. What's the current window size? Why is it six? Okay, that's one perspective we've, previously it was four the window size. We receive 
an act acknowledging two frames, four and five, means we're allowed to send another two. It goes from four to six. Or another way to look at it, there's one frame outstanding, frame six, we're allowed to have a maximum of seven outstanding, so we're allowed to send another six. Now, just note the values here. These two values are sequence numbers. Frame with sequence number five. Frame with sequence number six. This is a count of a number of frames. Six frames. This is the width of the blue rectangle. Previously it was seven, zero, one, and two. It would expand out to seven, zero, one, two, three, four. So we'd have six in the blue rectangle plus one frame, a maximum of seven. And that never changes, the, the count there. From the receiver's perspective, the last frame act is also five, because previously we had act up until three, the last frame act was three, we sent receive ready six, which implies we're acknowledging four and five. So this vertical bar will move along two positions to the right, which means the last one act is five. Last frame received is, last. so this means last frame received and not yet act, six. That is the last frame that's still in the buffer. It's six. Current window size? It's going to be the same. We've got one frame in the buffer, frame number six. Last frame received and not yet acknowledged. That's what it means. This vertical line moves to here. We still have received six. Remember, we received four, five, and six. We sent a receive ready which essentially acknowledges four and five only. Which means, so it's implying that we are acknowledging four and five. Uh, all right, maybe, maybe that this diagram is not very clear then. then most likely we would send that here if we show the timing on this diagram. Okay, that's not clear. We transmit this point in time. Transmit here, not after receiving the six. Yeah. So if I drew it, that would be receive frame five and then so shortly after frame six. Sorry, that's not clear. Yeah, we don't know, yeah. So it should be six because... Uh, so we still, after receiving, after sending the receive ready, we're still expecting six in that case. Yeah, so may, all right, maybe that's not clear. That's not a good case. Yeah. Yeah, ready for six, we expect to receive six. So yeah. it should be, but... It should okay. be, yeah. I should draw this diagram again and show exactly where it is. That's not clear in this case. Yeah. Let's finish. Last thing. So what happens? Sliding window. The blue rectangle is our window. As we transmit frames, this window closes on the left. So transmit a frame, the window was seven frames here, the blue rectangle, we transmitted four, we can think of the window closing, it gets smaller from the left hand side. It goes from seven to three. So transmitting frames closes the window on the left, receiving acts opens the window on the right. 
that's the concept of a window because it opens and closes. Transmitter frame allows us to send more. Sorry. Transmitter frame means we cannot, or reduces the number we're allowed to send, closes the window. Receiving an act allows us to send more. And the similar perspective of the receiver. And the window slides along, as you see. If we keep going, this window, if we have a large sequence, then we'll keep moving along. So we have a sliding window that can open and close on both sides. That's where the concept comes from. Next week, we'll look at how does that help with our performance. We haven't got to that yet. Why is it better than stop and wait? But just try to understand these concepts so far. And you'll see there's a homework question on the website already that asks you to consider the performance of stop and wait. And as the third question, see if you can solve about the performance of sliding window. But we will discuss that also next week. Enough for today, we're out of time. Let's continue and probably have a quiz. Quiz next week. If that's in the schedule, I can't remember. If there's a scheduled quiz next week, then it will cover everything up until the quiz. Uh, I'm not sure. It could be at the start or the end. It would cover everything that we've covered after the midterm up until the quiz. After the midterm, which is this week. It's not going to cover things before the midterm. Yes. Wednesday or Thursday it could be.